Hello, and welcome to the webinar series of the IT Journal on Future and Evolving Technologies. Uh, my name is Alessia Magliarditi from uh, ITU, the International Telecommunication Union. ITU is the United Nations Specialized Agency for Information and Communication Technologies. Uh, ITU allocates frequencies to the services that make use of the radio communication spectrum. It develops standards and assists developing countries in setting up their information and communication infrastructure. ITU and academia share a commitment to the public interest. And this commitment is embodied by the ITU Journal, which offers a complete coverage of communication and networking paradigms free of charge for both readers and authors. Our journal welcomes submissions at any time on any topic within its scope. And we believe that this new webinar series will inspire more contributions from researchers around the world. It is my pleasure to open today this webinar with Dr. Misha Dollar, Chief Architect in Ericsson from the Silicon Valley, who will speak about 6G and the metaverse that will power a holographic society. We count on your support to make this webinar an exciting experience. So please submit your questions via the Q&A channel. We will address them to the speaker during the Q&A session. After the talk and the Q&A, Please stay online. We have something very special for you. Dr. Dollar agreed to a very personal chat. He will share with us some lessons learned over the years that might perhaps be useful for some of you. It is now my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Ian Akilditz, Editor-in-Chief of the ITU Journal, as well as Founder and President of Truva from the United States. Uh, uh, Ian is Ken Bias Chair Professor in Telecommunication Emeritus at the Georgia Institute of Technology. In the last two decades, he has established many research centers worldwide, including in Spain, in Finland, South Africa, and Saudi Arabia. He's Editor-in-Chief Emeritus of Impact Factor Journals and highly cited and at the top of the most prestigious international rankings. Uh, is visiting distinguished professor in several universities around the world. His current research interests are in 6G, 7G, hologram communication, terahertz communication, internet of bio nano things, molecular communication, nano networks, and many others. So Professor Akildiz, the floor is yours for your opening remarks and to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Alessia. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, good night all around the world, wherever you are. Welcome to our webinar series of the IT Journal for Future Devolving Technologies. This is our fourth speaker in the series. I have the great pleasure and honor to present you our speaker today, Professor Misha Dollar. Before I present his uh, very interesting biography, I would like to share my personal connection to him. Uh, I met Misha 2005, Actually, I met him before, but he invited me to uh, King's College. He was organizing an IEEE conference. I think uh, I had to give a tutorial on wireless sensor networks. And we had a great time. We talked about uh, our interests. And I found them extremely interesting. So one of the maybe most interesting persons you can imagine in the research society, honestly, I really mean it. So he has an incredible background. Uh, first of all, he has a multicultural background from his parents. Also, uh, he has these unique uh, uh, futures like musician and intellectual because he comes from an intellectual family, by the way. Uh, it's really very unique. And uh, the guy is full of uh, knowledge and, uh, and extremely friendly person, by the way. And uh, I'm really grateful we kept our contact. Uh, we met at many conferences and I always joked about his uh, red shoes, <laughs> the man with the red shoes. I don't know that he still has them. So I'm very, we are very grateful to Misha for accepting our invitation to give this distinguished seminar covering 6G metaverse and holographic communication. Misha is currently uh, chief architect uh, uh, in, with Ericsson Incorporation in Silicon Valley, USA, since 2021. 
And uh, as I mentioned to you, he's also very unique. And I'll actually, I envy him that he jumps around uh, with uh, uh, Kinton Kegel in Germany, like with the family and kids <laughs> between different countries. So when I met him, he was in, the, in London with King's College. And uh, then he came back there at, in 2013, became a professor, by the way, and director in wireless communications research at King's College London. And before, uh, as I explained to you, uh, he was with uh, CCTC from 2013 uh, to, uh, I'm sorry, from 2008 to 2013. I'm trying to find out my, okay, then uh, in the CCTC in Barcelona, by the way, and he's the co-founder of Smart Cities pioneering company, World Sensing, where he was the CTO. And uh, I'm trying to find all my notes here. And uh, then in the meantime, he was also in Orange in Paris, France, after King's College. Then he went to CCTC Barcelona. Then he went back to King's College London. And uh, then finally now he is with Ericsson. So he has many, many uh, uh, accolades, uh, awards. He's one of the top 1% uh, of the uh, scientists with the citations. He has many impactful papers, papers and uh, patents, many patents. He has very good leading skills. So in short, I really say these from my mind now because I lost my uh, text here. And I'm extremely happy and uh, uh, honored to present you, uh, Misha, again. Thanks, Misha, for uh, accepting our invitation. And we look forward to listening to your presentation. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Ian. Uh, thanks for this uh, super kind introduction. And uh, really, we have been friends for now almost uh, two decades. And, uh, you know, by the way, every time, you know, I, I start a new topic, I know that Ian has done it uh, if uh, at 10, if not 20 years ago. So uh, let's see how today fares. And, um, you know, I thought uh, being in Silicon Valley now, there's no way I, I, I can't do a presentation without talking about the metaverse. Everybody is completely fired up here. The Valley um, from different perspectives, really. And working now for a, a, a vendor, connectivity telco vendor, yeah, Ericsson Inc. in the United States, uh, you know, talking about 6G is also uh, a must. So let's combine these two topics and see, you know, how they fit together, how does really uh, holography, uh, you know, XR, and, you know, all our immersive kind of society will emerge over the years to come. Uh, what the role of the metaverse will be and uh, whether 5G can do it or if we need 6G. And uh, these are the, the, tri the type of answers I'd like to get today. Uh, and of course, looking forward to your opinions and looking forward to your questions. I have to say, you know, that whenever we put the, the, the I put the title metaverse somewhere uh, in my presentation, the, the world is very kind of, uh, you know, split in opinion. So really, really looking forward to, to your to your uh, to your points of view. So I just uh, wanted to go back, you know, who, who's there uh, to the to, to the actual the terminology who, who invented metaverse really. And um, it was uh, Neil Stevenson. I met him in Stanford the other day as really fantastic, uh, you know, meeting him, talk to him. And, uh, you know, he, he, he coined that term quite a while back. We're talking 30 years back as part of his, um, you know, award-winning science fiction novel, um, uh, 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 Snow Crash, right? So, and the terminology was really a portmanteau of meta and universe. And actually, he got a lot of things right back then. And yeah, it really fascinated me as somebody, you know, uh, who like Ian, I have to say, you know, really um, is able to look into the future as if they have a crystal ball. Uh, not all of, a lot of people probably re read uh, Neil Stevenson's novels. He's quite well known in the literature, kind of in the cyberpunk ecosystem. Uh, but probably you haven't heard about him. But, uh, you know, now that uh, Meta in October, uh, sorry, Facebook uh, has uh, rebranded to Meta in October, you know, suddenly everybody's back to him. And I asked him, you know, is there any prediction you do for the next 30 years to come? Uh, he told me, but I can't tell you that. So let's let's see how this plays out. Maybe you can invite me in 30 years time again, and we can have a rundown of that. So here you go, the Metaverse, that 
was St uh, Neil Stevenson. Now, uh, what are examples? Well, it turns out, you know, the, the term is now 30 years old. Uh, it's super hot at the moment. It, but we have been having these metaverses already before, you know, Minecraft, anybody? I'm not sure, you know, your age group, but uh, my daughter, uh, my younger daughter, Dahlia, she's, uh, uh, she's living in Minecraft, you know? She, She's there all the time. She builds her world. She's with her friends. There's a uh, there's a chat within Minecraft, and often she would have WhatsApp on and just chat with her friends who are now scattered all around the world because we have been traveling, uh, you know, as a family moving around the world. So, uh, you know, Minecraft is really that social space for my daughter to to be there, do things, and communicate and socialize. Um, maybe you play Fortnite. I don't know, but you know, again, a, a, a game of uh, you know, probably from a graphics point of view, is a, is a different level to Minecraft. It has a, a different remit, really. But we're talking about a game here, which uh, which has been uh, you know fleshed out by Epic, and Epic is behind Unreal Engine, a super duper graphics engine. I'm in love with Unreal Engine. Unreal Engine Five came out, so they have been firing out Fortnite. Uh, you will have heard of Fortnite, not least because I started, uh, 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 um, uh, Tra Travis Scott did a, you know, a fantastic concert in there. So, you know, there's something happening there from a social point of view. It's not only going out there, battling, shooting and all this. There's actually social gathering. And then we have other stuff, which you have, probably have never heard about. And I just thought I'll introduce you a little bit about this. So uh, this is really decentralized. And uh, again, you know, it's a bit like Minecraft or Fortnite. You just uh, uh, go in there and you spend time there. And the, the interesting construct of Decentraland is that it's not owned, uh, you know, by anybody. It's a completely distributed artifact, uh, whereas Minecraft and Fortnite are owned by companies. Fortnite, for instance, by Epic. Decentraland is a decentralized land, right? So there's no 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 ownership per se. And uh, pertinent to our comms ecosystem, there's Ifland. It uh, was uh, fired out in, I think, last year, about this time last year by one of the leading telcos in Korea. And it's basically a metaverse land, uh, again, based on, <clears throat> on a distributed ledger. And I'll come to this in a moment. But the main aim is, you know, spend time there. They, they're offering it for doing conferences. So if you want to do a conference and really social engagement with your colleagues, have meetings, uh, workshops, etc., if land is your solution. So we're seeing these ecosystems emerging where suddenly, you know, with accelerated by the pandemic, uh, we see people gravitating into these social spaces, which aren't actually physical. So they're there, they're coming, they're coming fast and furious. And uh, the big question is really, what do they have in common, right? So what do all these spaces have in common? Well, first of all, and I put this really first because I think that's the most important thing that the metaverse really embraces a social element. This is not you or me uh, being in a singular room, virtual re reality. You're kind of, uh, you know, playing a game alone or you're exploring some space on uh, 3D Google Map or Google Earth. Uh, no, the metaverse is really about, you know, recreating that social space, that social fabric, which we enjoy as a society, uh, you know, in physical environments. But now we do that in the virtual world. And I gave you the example of my younger daughter playing Minecraft. And indeed, that is a very social engagement. This is not about, you know, her being alone in there. She's completely bored. She would never do that. It's being together and the metaverses will evolve over time. And hopefully at some point, we will be able to look into each other's eyes. We'll be able to touch each other, hug each other, shake hands and uh, recreate these worlds which we enjoy currently in the physical realm uh, second element it is of course virtual you know there is a whether that's virtual reality or whether it is augmented reality there's a digital element which is somehow overlaid over that physical world either completely or partially Right. And um, the role of that virtual is really to help you bridge these physical gaps and also mend it with new capabilities, things we couldn't do before, things which physics wouldn't allow us to do. And suddenly you can tap with nature and really go beyond what, uh, you know, we were able to do as human beings so far. And third, of course, we do have technologies which, which accelerate the metaverse, right? So we have uh, stuff like Web 3.0, 5G, 6G, AI, XR, so, uh, you know, VR and AR and uh, haptic kind of devices. Um, is a fascinating ecosystem emerging there. And I thought today what I'll do is I'll spend time on at least three of these accelerating technologies. And you will understand that the metaverse could exist uh, without these technologies. It could, right? So and you will see 
that as I go through the presentation. Uh, but clearly, having these technologies in place allows us to accelerate that whole process, the uptake and building that digital social fabric. Now, the three uh, technologies I'd love to talk to, uh, to you about today is Web 3.0 as a construct that's quite new to us from a telco point of view. And I thought I'll spend a bit of time on this. I won't do any fundamentals on blockchain or anything, but uh, I, I, I just give you an overview and I want, would like you to understand how that sits with the, with the metaverse, really. The second thing I'll talk about are the new devices, XR devices holographic devices, all that stuff, you know, how does that sit with that metaverse ambitions? And last but not least, we'll talk about the network. And uh, at the very end of the presentation, I'll pose three questions to you, okay? Uh, two serious questions and, and one more of a request, but, you know, so keep, uh, keep alert, you know, pay attention and let's see if we can answer these questions at the very end. So let's get going. Let's start with Web 3.0. Now, what is Web 3.0? Well, you know, it is in fact a blockchain construct. So, and blockchains are uh, super simple. There's no magic there, to be honest. You know, we sometimes call blockchains ledgers and a ledger in English uh, you know, in the old English was a book. It's simply a book, right? So a ledger where you keep entries, specifically the church would keep entries who was born on what day, right? In that ledger. Now, the problem with these ledgers was that if the church burns down, the information is gone. So uh, we then invented, you know, book printing and we started to create distributed ledgers, make copies of many books, right? So whether that these are Ian's books or mine books or my books or Neil Stevenson books, we always printed like 100,000 copies. Now, uh, to, to actually burn or destroy all these uh, copies in one go is quite difficult already. So the notion of having many copies distributed around the world is quite attractive. And if you can do that digitally, therefore amend it in real time, add information, add pages in, in, info, in, in real time, that's a huge advantage. And that's what blockchain is doing, right? So we are just writing every time you know, new pages, they are digital pages. Think of them like a, a Microsoft Word page. There are transactions going in or anything you want to do. Then we build a cryptographic hash of that page and we link it cryptographically to the previous page. In other words, uh, you know, if somebody was to rip out this page and uh, this digital page, they couldn't do it because it wouldn't sit well with the previous and the subsequent page. So therefore, we have a lot of cryptographic magic happening there to make sure that nobody can tamper with our ledger. Um, and then what we do is we distribute it. OK, so I have a copy of that ledger on my computer. And because blockchains are distributed, we would copy it to maybe millions of computers around the world. So we're creating a, a construct which gives us provenance because you can't really modify information. Um, you know, in this single church ledger, somebody could go back and just with Tipex go over and change the birth date or change, you know, the birth name, whatever. Uh, we can't do this with blockchains anymore. And, uh, you know, to completely change information, you would need to you know, get majority. So you probably need to get control of uh, millions of computers to make that happen. So this is what it is. Really. And Web 3.0 is nothing else but a blockchain construct. And people realize that, you know, rather than just putting transactions into a Word document, you can actually run code. You can run code and execute it in a distributed fashion. And it has the same advantage because there is no company which can kill the application. And we started to call this a D apps for distributed apps. Okay, and it gives a lot of longevity, provenance, trust. Uh, in other words, you know, an application which before maybe Chrome, we had a Chrome the browser. If Google decides, uh, you know, to stop the Chrome project, that's it. Or what? Okay, uh, or, or or Meta, um, you know, decides to kill WhatsApp or, or Facebook, right? So or Dropbox decides to stop functioning. That, that's it. They close it, and uh, we as users are completely dependent on that. Uh, along comes Web 3.0, and suddenly we have a construct which is completely distributed, right? So Chrome uh, goes into Brave. If you haven't used Brave yet, please do. A fantastic web browser. Um, you know, drop chain goes into this uh, IP, uh, IPFS. So it's an international kind of uh, distributed packet uh, file system. Uh, you know, you see all these uh, different applications here and suddenly we're going from a, uh, a construct web 3.0, which is read and write and very interactive. So we love it. You can hear me right now speaking, uh, but there's no ownership. 
and we have no trust really, right? So uh, we, we believe that our information and what's up is enter in, encrypted. Um, who knows, right? Who knows what's really on the way? And uh, um, so therefore the ability to have really building a very trusted internet is quite important than an internet which doesn't have a single sole uh, responsibility and, and, and ownership. And that's, I think, really, really powerful. So what we see is really this new OZ stack coming. You know, I call this a new uh, OZ stack and you will have learned that from your computer science day. Uh, you know, we have abstracted various comms functionalities. So there's the, 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 this Web 3.0 calls really for something completely new. And uh, at the lower part, we have this infrastructure layer, right? I call that also an operating system. Think of it as an operating system. These are our blockchain, okay? So our actual mechanical blockchain, this act of filling in the ledger and distributing it across the world, right? So we have different ones. You probably know, you know, Bitcoin would be one of these infrastructure layers, uh, but we have others uh, such as Ethereum or Solana or, or EOS, okay? And um, these ones really form the, the basis of, of our Web 3.0 ecosystem. What you then can do, you can build on top is, uh, you know, what I call this token layer or the value layer. And uh, this would be essentially uh, building uh, coins. You know, you start building coins out of your basic uh, blockchain. Um, you know, the philosophy behind this is really very simple. You just attach some value uh, to each of the transactions which are happening. <coughs> Apologies. But uh, the idea is essentially that uh, based on one single blockchain, let's take the example of Ethereum, you can build different coins, right? So the examples I've given here is, you know, the Decentraland token, the Sandbox token, uh, you know, they're all based on that operating system called uh, Ethereum. And then we need, of course, you know, ways of paying for that. So you need a wallet and MetaMask is a great wallet, um, you know, which works really well with a Brave, Brave browser. And then you need to exchange also your coins. You want to exchange maybe a, um, you know, a sandbox coin with a decentralized coin. Uh, you would like to exchange it maybe against the US dollar, the euro, uh, wherever you are really in the world. So we need exchanges. So Coinbase came along. So we have this whole value ecosystem, um, you know, arriving at token layer. And of course, we also have um, assets, NFTs. You will have heard about this. I could probably give another oh, one. One or two hours a webinar on NFTs, um, but you know websites like OpenSea or Rarible uh, are quite popular. I'm actually on OpenSea and I think on Rarible as well. I can't remember. And um, in the you know I, I I publish content there NFTs. <clears throat> and the beauty is you know and listen to this you know as long as your your token layer runs on the very same uh, operating system or so on the same infrastructure, they're completely interoperable. Right, so there's no problem. I can, for instance, uh, uh, OpenSea, you know, if it runs, uh, it runs on Ethereum, you know, I can port essentially value from one ecosystem to another very seamlessly because it sits on the same operating system. So this is really fascinating. And once we've done this, you know, we've sorted out this value, the token layer, we can go to the actually application layer, the DApp layer. And this is where the exciting apps really come. Uh, Decentraland, you know, Sandbox, Upland, these are these metaverses build, you know, graphical instances, uh, you know, build in a distributed way where you can gather, you can mingle, uh, you can exchange value. And for instance, you know, Decentraland and Sandbox run on Ethereum. And uh, what I can do now is, and that is really fascinating, I can, uh, you know, use my assets, which I've uploaded in OpenSea across Decentraland and Sandbox, or I can buy something from, uh, you know, using my MetaMask via Coinbase, I buy in dollars an asset, because I like maybe a red jacket in the metaverse or on the, as an NFT, I buy that. And then I can use it in any of the platforms which actually uses the infra layer. So that's what really that very standardized way of operations. And um, you can see we have different blockchains. So we still have a little bit of work to, to do. But as long as they run in the same blockchain, that's the magic you can do. But there's still one challenge, right, ladies and gentlemen, there's a big challenge of energy. You may have heard about this. The FT has published, the Financial Times has published a really fascinating issue there. Um, you know, Bitcoin is always in the in the prime light. Uh, you know, to make these blockchains work, you need to, you need to really mine coins. It, uh, it requires a lot of compute power. In the meantime, you know, the power used by Bitcoin is in the order of the power consumption of entire countries. Right, entire countries. This is crazy. We're trying to get away 
you know, from fossil fuel. We're trying to, to become more energy efficient, more sustainable. And uh, along comes a construct, which seems to be extremely, uh, you know, attractive, yet it consumes so much energy. And Ethereum uh, has been running on, on proof of work for, for many years and is now migrating to proof of stake, which is an interesting migration because it will now become 99.99% more energy efficient. That migration has not happened yet entirely. Phase one has been completed. Uh, phase two was due any day now. So hopefully this can happen. And then the whole ecosystem, which is powering, you know, my tokens, my uh, my NFTs in the metaverse landscape, you know, will become more energy efficient. And a lot of work more to do and a lot of research work really more to do. And if we were to embed, you know, blockchain into telco, then we would need to adopt straight ahead these very energy efficient and very uh, you know sustainable blockchain uh, methodologies. So, so I just want to leave that with you so you don't forget about this. Let's move on now to the you know the, to the XR devices, and um, this is really your gateway into the metaverse, right? So we need them. We can't do anything about it. And uh, uh, think about it. You know, the, the um, let's say all the applications we run now on the wireless internet, uh, we're really dependent on the emergence of the smartphone. First the iPhone and then other smartphones came along. So the, the, the devices are super important. We always need two or three things to fall together at the same time. These are the devices, um, you know, the networks and the applications. So therefore the application I just talked about is, let's talk about the devices now, let's later talk about the networks. Um, and, you know, the metaverse not necessarily needs to be consumed via a VR headset. So you don't necessarily need to do that. And then um, you can use your smartphone. You know, there's perfectly, it's a perfectly good medium for you to view it. Your computer, it's a 2D screen, yet you're navigating a 3D world. And we have all done this before. Um, and whether you're, you're actually using your, you know, moving your phone around uh, or you're using your mouse or your cursor to actually navigate, it's possible. It's a bit uh, cumbersome, but it's possible. Then, you know, to go into this 3D perception, a fascinating company I visited the other day in Silicon Valley, it's called uh, Leia. And Leia has uh, developed a, a new technology which allows you essentially to look at the 2D screen and get a super duper 3D impression. I was really impressed. I didn't expect this at all. In fact, they're, they're working, you know, if you go to their website, you will see they're working essentially with uh, several layers in the, um, in the 2D screen in a sense. So the 2D screen isn't really 2D. It's a 3D stacked layers, uh, building these uh, holographic impressions. And, uh, you know, I played a game on that. It was so immersive and uh, it didn't have that problem of field of view where you couldn't really figure out where to look at, et cetera. So really fantastic technology. Then of course we got uh, 3D stuff coming out or has been around for a long time, VR headsets, uh, which I think are, VR I think is great for enterprise applications. Do I see that happening for consumer space long-term to go? I don't think so. I mean, I'm happy to be challenged here. It is um, it is clearly, you know, interesting for uh, a niche population, gamers or anybody who's uh, maybe in, in architecture architecture or wants to play around with uh, a 3D construct, 3D worlds, is very passionate about metaverse. Uh, VR is great. So now, you know, it allows us to, to really do uh, 3D rendering at high fidelity in a very controlled manner. But, um, you know, I'm not sure if you have used it. I've used it. And the, the number of times I had uh, my daughters, uh, uh, you know, making sure I don't crash into <laughs> the TV, you know, is, it was, was very high. So, you know, it's, it's clearly not very practical. And, of course, we have see-through capabilities now. Ecosystem works on this. So maybe, you know, the jury is still out. But uh, for me, it, it's, it's nice to be. I have two headsets at home. I play around, but I don't see a huge future for that. Now, holographics and AR is a different story altogether. You know, so we have, I'll show you in a moment, you know, Ericsson has done quite a lot of work on, on holography as well, how to set this up really from a, a, a device and networking point of view. Um, AR is coming now big time and, uh, you know, the rumors are, 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 are ripe and around uh, about for, you know, all the big device companies here in Silicon Valley to release devices over the next months. And now hopefully this will happen. We don't know really, but hopefully this will happen and we'll have really advanced uh, augmented reality glasses, which are giving you this over overlay. You can then play Pokemon Go, um, you know, in a much more seamless way. But for XR, you know, we are talking about XR as an Uber term for AR, VR, 
plus uh, actually haptic engagement, right? So we really want to transmit senses. So you got these haptic gloves and I've worked a lot with haptic gloves in the past. And, you know, with uh, done by my friends in Spain, I was very new digital great company uh, you know there's new stuff coming also from the consumption of ar module vision uh, doing ar contact lenses they're really advancing the game here so the ecosystem is evolving and i called it more than 3d because it has that 4d element at time because you move around and your compute engines need to recalculate your spatial construct so therefore there's a very strong temporal dependency on your compute stack which which is why you know i personally call this beyond 3d you know, call it 4D, whatever you want to call it, or 5D or 6D, um, you know, that is that is essentially matches. I hope that makes uh, sense to you. Um, but uh, one thing which we really need to get right is that, uh, you know, that untetheredness. And uh, if anybody of you, of you have used, uh, you know, VR or, you know, a prototype AR glasses, you know, they're often tested because they need battery. They need, um, you know, the comms channel because the rendering is very complicated and it's done on a GPU super duper machine, maybe two meters from you. So you need a cable out of this. It is very cumbersome. So over the years, we have migrated now to the end game, which is that 5G uh, virtual reality device and 5G augmented reality device. So the idea is to have a chip. In fact, it's not an idea. It's reality, a chip in your uh, XR device. And that would seamlessly connect to a 5G system, super duper low latency, high bandwidth. So a lot of stuff can actually be uh, you know, offloaded and the compute tasks can be done somewhere else. And that gives us that flexibility it gives this uh untetheredness uh, really this being together and um you know the 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 ecosystem now has really evolved so far that we are ready we're ready to get this out operators are ready to roll it out we just need the devices really to come along and make that happen and uh, from what happens in the background is really interesting to understand and i just want you to know what's actually happening when within the next months you will buy an xr uh, device and you put it on your head so there's a lot of stuff that xr device needs to do in real time you know like really quickly within milliseconds uh, let's start from the bottom left here so you need to get sensor data right you need to acquire sensor data uh you need to get your look Localization data, so uh, point cloud data. You need to do spatial mapping. You need to optimize the map. You need to detect objects. You need to track objects. And then comes all the other rendering to that, right? So, um, but the basic tasks of a typical AR device are these. So you can do them all on your device, right? So you can say, hey, I'm going to have, you know, uh, all of it run on the device. And um, it's quite computationally intensive. Battery runs out. You either need very big batteries <clears throat> or you need to recharge it after a few minutes. Not very practical. So we started to looking at offloading this, right? So in a mobile edge cloud, in a, in a cloud which isn't very far from you. So it can't be on the other side of the world because uh, the tasks need to be done very quickly. So you see, Vince, in a low offload scenario, my uh, augmented reality glasses would maybe start, you know, um, offloading maybe my app, map optimization, point, uh, point cloud data, and that's all good. In a mid offload scenario, we would offload more. In an high offload scenario, we would offload everything except the actual sensor acquisition. So you would still need would you get the lighter uh, point cloud or the uh, optical data. But it, you know, you can offload this, and that means my raw data is being streamed from my glasses. Imagine these are my glasses. Uh, that is being streamed in real time to a mobile edge cloud. Uh, there we would have a compute stack, you know, a GPU, CPU, maybe, you know, Cloud XR from NVIDIA. So there's a, a lot of computing happening here uh, very quickly. And then it's being streamed down back to me like a Netflix movie. So I have the impression it's happening on my glasses. But in reality, it, uh, you know, only the controls gone up, rendering done somewhere else and then being downstream like a Netflix movie onto my glasses. And all that has to happen within a few milliseconds, because if not, if you move and uh, you don't get that updated spatial information, you know, it's worth nothing. You get very dizzy. Nobody will like that. So therefore that was a big challenge we needed to solve. And I think 5G really stood up to that challenge. And, you know, we have done a fantastic demo here. My, my wonderful Ericsson colleagues here in Silicon Valley, together with AT&T, um, you know, with NVIDIA, Qualcomm, Dreamscape, you know, as a, a very cross-disciplinary exercise, really. You know, Ericsson provided the base station equipment and the core network and all the, 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 the networking gear. Um, Qualcomm provided, you know, the, the chip, of course, on the device side. Then we had AT&T providing the spectrum and the overall envelope. You know, we had Dreamscape 
and we've another company provided you know the uh, the immersive content content and if you if and, and the, the final result was you put on your VR headset completely untethered and you had a very immersive experience in this Harry Potter world. If you're a big Harry Potter uh, fan, uh, visit Los Angeles, uh, Burbank, Universal Studios, and you get a, a, a fantastic kind of uh, experience there. And I think Dreamscape also has now an experience up and running there. Uh, so there's a lot of really interesting stuff happening there. Verizon has now kicked in. Other operators uh, have really latched on their power of that fully immersive thing. Then, you know, Ericsson at this Mobile World Congress uh, presented something uh, pioneering. It's called Colotaring. And, um, you know, that, that was a video. I couldn't make it really work. So I invite you to click on this or just Google that link here. I believe, you know, the, the recording, you can stop the recording. Just have a look on this link, Google that, and sign up to this, and you will be able to see that. And uh, what you see is a, a, a young lady on the left uh, communicating with a holotar of another a lady uh, on the right. And um, this is fully immersive, very, very high rendering graphics, very high quality. Everybody was well, not surprised, shocked almost to see the quality of that engagement. And uh, that video there shows you really on how this has been done, the behind the scenes on how we have done that. And of course, at the very center of that is a very powerful network uh, called 5G, right? So have a look at that uh, video. But what's the roadmap now? What's the roadmap for our holographic society for this fully uh, immersive engagement? Our, you know, the future of that digital social fabric leading to this metaverse. Well, you know, today we have the Tefer devices. Uh, in the near future, we're going to get these uh, 5G low offload and medium offload AR devices. Uh, it's going to move into a high offload arena in the in the in the long term as well as these contact lenses, which I, I find a fairly fascinating construct. You know, some of, some of you will say this is a bit uh, Black Mirror scenario. Uh, happy to discuss that. I think you know, loads of ethical implications, uh, privacy implications, et cetera. Uh, we can talk about this at the very end. Uh, but that's the roadmap as we see that. You see some dots there. We do know the numbers, of course. Uh, we're not much allowed to talk about this, but uh, you can work it out yourself. There's not too much magic there to, do, to derive these upload rates and down download rates and then you know get these uh, milliseconds but what I did is rather than taking our numbers um, I, I dug out a really great report by the GSMA and let's start talking really about that connectivity now um, you know GSMA has published that cloud AR VR white paper um, just uh, search for that you can literally download that with, uh, within 10 seconds and I pulled out one figure which really struck me there and uh, this is really the requirement so if you're really going immersive and we're always going more immersive people saying you know we don't need this and all that but you know the trend's always been there uh look at what we need for a 360 virtual reality 4k type of video transmission with a typical h265 codec well you know the top two lines is something we can handle we can handle with 5g uh, from a data rate from a latency point of view now as you go down and you go to higher resolutions and uh, more immersive engagement you know, 5G is a stretch. So you can do that at peak rate for individual users, but we are really thinking of powering a society, uh, billions of people around the world. And this is the very first time we need to start saying, hey, you know, if we are serious about these metaverse constructs, if we are serious about this new social digital fabric, um, which hopefully is very human centric, right? Not only kind of tech centric, but if we are serious about this, you know, we need to start talking 6G, right? So we need to understand what do we really need to get out of, uh, you know, these future networks? I just wanted to show you these data rates. That is alarming, right? So we're talking about half a gigabits per second uh, just to maintain your, in the future, you know, your, your, your fully immersive uh, virtual augmented reality. Stream. So, yeah, it's a huge data rates. So, these are the challenges, ladies and gentlemen. There's loads of challenges. I don't want to talk about all of that. We talked a bit about, about the you know, ubiquitous access uh, to really make sure these multiverses uh, can be connected to give a feeling of, uh, of a metaverse. And, you know, we, we are mentioning multiverses here. Uh, because it, it kind of resembles a little bit our early days of the local area networks, right? So some of you on this uh, webinar will remember the days when we actually constructed the internet. You remember the 90s uh, uh, when we were nailing ethernet cables on the walls in our homes and our dorms 
Um, these were the days we constructed a local area network, right? So, uh, but the internet wasn't really around. And then we connected everything and uh, we had IP and we had codecs and suddenly we constructed this uh, fantastic fabric. And uh, we are a little bit in this, in the, in, the multi, in the metaverse world. So we don't have a metaverse. We don't have, as we have the internet now, we have uh, loads of metaverses and that's what we call them multiverses. And they're not connected at the moment. If they run on a different uh, fabric, if they don't run on the same blockchain, they can't talk to each other, right? Or a centralized or the distributed one, they just can't talk to each other. So therefore, we need we need to really make sure we connect them well. Uh, we need the lightweight devices, and that is coming. And we figured out, you know, in Ericsson, we did a fascinating study, and I provided you the link in the previous slide. Uh, that when you do offload, you know, most if not all of the tasks to an edge cloud the energy consumption on your device goes down by a factor of seven, right? So think of it as an order of magnitude improvement. Orders of magnitude improvements always move the needle, okay? They always uh, allow you to, uh, to do something significantly better, cheaper, and therefore we, we are very hopeful that with the uh, 5G offloading capabilities, we are able now to enable devices which are you know smaller, have a smaller form factor, cheaper, smaller batteries, uh, are lighter, so just a more pleasant experience for us consumers. Uh, we need to get a good fabric of our edge cloud, the third point here, really make sure we have a dense enough uh, a global compute infrastructure. And uh, you know, all the big players, the hyperscalers, uh, you know, and companies like Equinix, etc., you know, really providing this around the world. They're making sure that there's a cloud within 10 milliseconds, no matter where you are on the planet, right? So this is the, the kind of the new mantra of the cloud community, make sure that a cloud is somewhere, compute fabric is very close to the consumers. And that will help us to re-enhance the level of the rendering, graphics get better, engagement gets better, the social construct goes better, hugely important really. But let, let me go into two topics which are very close to my heart. And uh, you know, topic number four is standards. We really need standards. We need telco standards for the metaverse. I alluded to this a little bit when I talked about the multiverses. We need standards for haptics and holographics, right? And uh, we, what we don't want is to have a vendor lock-in, right? So we don't want a haptic glove, which only works with a haptic glove of the same vendor or an exoskeleton, which works with a holographic device, you know, of the same vendor. It has to have, it has to be a very standardized ecosystem. And I recognize that if uh, four or five years back, and I co-founded the IEEE Tactile Internet Working Group, where we, uh, where I specifically insisted on the creation of a haptic standards uh, working group. So uh, that is led by people who really understand this world. I don't understand that world. Uh, we have, uh, you know, uh, uh, Eckhart uh, from uh, from TU Munich driving that. Fascinating research, fascinating output. Now we are really ready now with these standards documents. Uh, high, you know, chime in if you, if you want to. And we need the same thing for holographics. We need the same thing for metaverse. So we really need these standards to be defined. And I, I really call for the uh, ITU really, and I'm now on the ITU call to really help us do this. And I'd be happy, you know, to help the ITU to define the metaverse standards uh, to really get this going. And last but not least, you know, we need to stop thinking as a platform. The networking community needs to something like a platform, right? This is what the hyperscalers have done, the cloud providers. This is what the application providers have done, really they think as a platform. And sitting in Silicon Valley, of course, we're very keen of uh, exercising this. So how can we make sure that 5G and 6G really isn't a very bespoke construct anymore? How can we make it such that everybody, any developer around the world, can just make an API call to say, hey, I want this slice, uh, I want this and that, right? So this is one of the open and exciting challenges we are facing over the next months and years to come. So this is just a, a very quick overview. I could spend probably hours just on this slide, but let's move on. And I just wanna talk a little about about 6G. We have seen that the uh, 5G rates are really good for what we have today in the next years to come, but the future requires more, right? So the future requires more. And uh, from our point of view, we kind of structured that into four big areas. This is really how we gear all our research, our standards work, our product development. So the first one is really all about this Internet of Senses. It's the Internet of Skills, as I defined it when I was still at King's, a very uh, massive multi-sensory reality experience. So really this metaverse experience we just talked about. 
We also want to empower machines, right? So this is all about connected intelligent machines. And you can imagine they require very, very low latency, very high data rate, more and more machines coming online, uh, very high security really. Uh, and this is where 6G really kicks in uh, very, very, very strongly. And then we need this programmable world, right? The ability to not only ingest data, but actually downstream it again, uh, you know, con uh, program actuators, uh, MEMS, you know, devices uh, change our world, right? According to what we have measured in the first two boxes there. And last but not least, we really made the sustainability angle the core mantra of uh, Ericsson, really make sure that whatever we do is energy efficient, is sustainable, is trans transparent uh, and really makes sense from a from an overall societal point of view. So these are our focus areas. And, uh, you know, I, I thought to, to talk you through a little bit about the roadmap now, how we think we can get there. How can we address? How can we really, uh, you know, make, make sure we, we get to the uh, to these uh, uh, to these four uh, topics I talked about? So what we had in 5G are these uh, three areas, right? Defined by the 3GPP and ITU, Etsy, NGMN, everybody talked about, you know, in 5G about these three telco use cases. And it was about 10 years ago, oh my God, time is flying. 10 years ago, we talked about enhanced mobile broadband. So this is your mobile phone, just a little bit, better. you know, your 4G experience, just really 10 times better. We talked about massive machine type communications, which is basically the uh, IoT stuff we had already in 4G, but better at scale, basically, uh, going from you know uh, hundreds of thousands of sensors we can connect now to millions, uh, uh, tens of millions of sensors. And then the new box here was this ultra reliable low latency comms box, right? So very low latency stuff. Uh, you know, Gerhard called it uh, tactile internet, uh, 3GPP called it the ultra reliable low latency uh, uh, comms. Uh, I call that, uh, you know, uh, for me, it was an enabler for the uh, uh, internet of skills. The, the message here is, you know, uh, your LLC is all about very low latency, very high reliability. You need your packets within 10 milliseconds and you can't lose any of these packets, right? So we made sure 5G can do that. Very different use cases, yet one platform able to do that. That's really fascinating, right? Now, 5G advanced now, the next releases are coming in 3GBP and we're, we're trying to understand how can we make this better, right? So these three boxes, so we make these, this triangle a little bit larger, but 6G will be fundamentally bigger, right? Will be different, will be envelope in requirements, which goes from immersive comms, you know, critical service, spatial temporal understanding, uh, you know, uh, flattening of compute and AI, you know, it's a, it's a very interesting construct really coming there with 6G early days. We still yet don't know yet exactly how we're going to do it, but I think we get a good idea, you know, what we're going to do and what we need to achieve at the end of that 6G design roadmap. And uh, how does that look? Okay roadmap look like? So these are projections. We don't know exactly, right? So how things will really kick off. But typically, and we do this uh, you know, successfully now for many generations, we do basic research. So probably the, the 6G basic research will, you know, started in 2017. Probably the earliest one uh, was in Finland, Mati with your 6G center um, in, uh, in, in Ulu. And the world has now really picked up with that. You know, there's no country, no university, no research center, which doesn't look into this very fundamental 6G research. And uh, that 6G research will probably come to its conclusions largely with the fundamental techniques in 2023. And uh, now already, you know, alliances and industry bodies have taken over. The ITU is looking at the requirements, right? Uh, yeah, very typical process for the ITU to say, you know, for a telco uh, generation to be called 5G or now 6G, it needs to have these type of requirements. So therefore the ITU will kick in, we'll start to look into spectrum. So there's a lot of stuff which uh, needs to be prepared. And this is then when we start around 2024, you know, 25, we start with the 6G tech standards. So specifically, 3GPP works and releases. In 3GPP, we don't talk about generations. We talk about uh, uh, releases. So release, you know, 19, uh, you know, we'll have, you know, good 6G content hopefully already in there. Let's see how this pans out really in the future to come. And then in the end, it will go commercial at the end of this decade. And then, uh, you know, we'll go into 7G. You heard uh, Ian already talking about this. So, you know, 7G will come. Uh, and maybe at some point we'll stop talking about G's. Uh, we had just had a really fascinating panel, you know, with uh, uh, Muriel from MIT, Ubli and Ravi. <clears throat> 
just look it up or, or, or contact me. That panel was really about the future of the generations. And we're having these discussions with every generation, uh, but it's getting uh, more interesting by, 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 the, by the decade, I have to say. <laughs> right. So um, what do we really need to uh, do to get 6G right? And what is really 6G? Well, you know, I could spend another one or two hours to talk about this. And in, in fact, we do have presentations about 6G, just about 6G. But since I wanted to give you the wide envelope of why we do this 6G, how does it sit with the devices and the metaverse? You know, let's just have maybe one or two slides on this. So from a spectrum point of view, and I'm, I'm pushing, pulling this out, this slide is because it's really the bread and butter of the ITU and later it will be part of the World Radio Conference um, discussions in 2023 um, and really influences regulators all around the world. And I'm sitting on the spectrum advisory board of Ofcom, which is the UK regulator. Um, and really what we're looking at here, well, you know, we do have prime spectrum. I really have to say this. So, you know, before we get carried away saying, let's go to 100 gigs and terahertz and all that, you know, the prime spectrum, 80%, and it's an estimate, my personal estimate, 80% of the economic value, um, you know, of the telco ecosystem is actually carried in these mid-bands, okay? And these are the, uh, you know, this is not below gig, but anything between one gig to six gig is what we're talking about in 5G. But that mid-band now, in my opinion, is stretched a little bit further uh, for 6G around, you know, 7 to 24 gigs. We're talking 12 gig, 15 gigahertz now uh, frequencies. And there's quite a bit of spectrum. Now, of course, it's uh, some of that is being used by satellite, by government. Uh, so the ITU will have a lot of headache of actually sorting out on global scale, which are the bands within this green, you know, green, uh, 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 green band here, which could be used for 6G. Once these have been identified, uh, everybody goes to the World Radio Conference, negotiates very hard, and then you know, the different regulators around the world need to implement them. So you can see that the uh, this green spectrum from 724 gig is strictly speaking not millimeter wave yet. Okay, millimeter wave. Uh, if you look at really when when there's a millimeter of a wavelength kick in, it would be around 33 gigahertz. So in fact, the millimeter wave systems in 5G are also not millimeter waves. So I think maybe somebody will realize at some point. But anyway, so I think, you know, that middle green spectrum is super prime. Why is it prime? Great propagation characteristics, right? It starts to have radar capabilities. Well, I'll see in the next slide, we need that. Um, it uh, starts to, it is very good with our device ecosystem because you need to manufacture power amplifiers, right? So it is a very different story to a power amplifier at 10 gigahertz uh, compared to one terahertz. Uh, then we need to de uh, design sampling chips, right? So uh, we don't know yet how to sample beyond one bit sampling in the terahertz range, right? So therefore, loads of challenges up there. We have a lot of bandwidth, it's very easy, but from a device and industrial ecosystem, loads of research challenges here. So therefore, I think the ITU needs to get that mid band, right? And we need to start looking at the higher band. So I'm not saying we shouldn't do that, right? So we need to look at this, try to understand the needs. What can we do up there? Uh, what are the exciting applications up there? And they are, they really are. And if I look at this, one which really jumps out, and I think that will be a very fundamental feature of 6G is that joint sensing and communications. And uh, a lot of people have worked on this already for quite a while. And uh, not least Ian actually is in the call here. Uh, we had information theorists looking at this, you know, from a modulation point of view, from a practical point of view. What's well, what's the idea? The idea is, um, you know, every time I'm sending a radio signal from my mobile phone, right? So I'm I'm making a phone call here with my with my phone, and it's emitting radio signals. Now, what we are trying to do is to get some of these radio signals to my base station, which is somewhere on the roof, so I can actually call to my friends and uh, you know to 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 my family, and. But some of these waves actually get reflected. The majority of these waves get reflected in the very room I'm sitting in. Uh, and we are discarding them uh, currently. But what about using them? What about using these reflected waves and starting to understand what is my spatial environment? What is my 3D environment here in real time, right? And of course, the higher I go in the carrier frequency, the shorter the wavelength and the better the resolution. So maybe, you know, at the typical two gigahertz, which is some 30, uh, uh, you know, some, some, uh, some 10 centimeters, 12 centimeters uh, a wavelength, I can resolve objects which are large. So probably the chair here, the table. As I move up now into the higher frequencies, the wavelength gets shorter. I'm able now suddenly to resolve this cap. 
I'm able to resolve my glasses, right? So, and suddenly you get a 3D picture. And why is that important? Well, the metaverse, right? So we just talked about this holographic capabilities because the other side whom you're talking to, uh, the people you're engaging with, they would like to get a 360 real-time picture of where you are, what are you doing, how do you take, do you smile, do you move your hands, um, you know, what, what are you up to in general in the environment, right? So, and therefore, this is where this joint sensing and comms comes in and could be a very, very powerful, you know, kind of um, asset in our 6G toolbox. Now, what, what does that um, then look like? So if we were to implement this, you know, coming to my last slide, say, if, uh, if we were to implement that, you know, this is how we see that from uh, Ericsson's world and uh, bring it all together. So we do have a physical world. It's providing a lot of sensing data into our digital world. We're doing a, re a lot of real-time processing which I just explained, and then we can act on that because we have sensors, we have actuators, we have robots, we have drones. So suddenly we get this loop between the digital and the physical world, and we get this cyber-physical continuum, and we are able to program these worlds, right? So we literally get programmable worlds uh, based on this cyber-physical continuum. So we are getting there. 6G probably will be the first baby steps in making this happen. There's a, you know, there's juxtaposition of sensing, action, and really augmenting the experiences, right? So that's the world we're looking at. You know, it's on one hand, of course, it is super scary. On the other hand, it is very, very exciting. Uh, this future world to come. I want to conclude, you know, with a few questions. And actually, two of these questions uh, address a little bit the dark side. And uh, I like to bring this out because it's always a difficult conversation, and it's a conversation we should rather have early on than very late in the game. Uh, we need to be honest with each other, and I think we as engineers have responsibilities, ethical responsibilities, to get things right. So the first question I'm posing to you as a community is, you know, are we approaching AI singularity? Now, uh, singularity has been coined in 2003 uh, by our colleagues in Oxford, philosophers, um, really saying that the moment we design machines, we design artificial intelligence, which is able to learn quicker than, than we can teach it, we will have singularity because their aggregate knowledge will actually evolve exponentially and rather linearly like it happens with uh, with uh, humanity or it will be super exponential rather than exponential as we have with humanity, right? And the big question I'm asking now with the emergence of, you know, of powerful devices, of our 5G, 6G networks, of AI, um, you know, is there, are we approaching this singularity? Now, I'd like you to understand why I think that we need to pay attention here. So today we're using AI quite frequently across a lot of digital services, right? So we're doing this already. There's nothing new there. And, uh, but what we have been doing over the last years is really to design new accelerator infrastructure, right? And I haven't talked about this today at all, but it's out there. It's coming. It's coming fast and furious. We've come up with new storage and new compute paradigms. So we talk about neuromorphic computing, extraordinary low energy. You know, you wouldn't believe it. Uh, uh, multiplication, which is a very energy uh, intensive operation in a traditional, you know, digital device in a neuromorphic device is zero joules, like zero, right? It doesn't cost you any energy. So suddenly we're in a world where the energy consumption of doing these computes is uh, getting to the, you know, within probably not yet within the order of magnitude of our human brain, but, you know, we're, we're on that trajectory. Then we got quantum. Quantum can do a lot of stuff, which before we couldn't do with tr uh, traditional computers. We got new networks, right? You put it all together and suddenly my AI framework can do things which are, you know, so much more powerful. Now you, uh, and I call this first loop here, the digital service loop. Now the emergence of the metaverse allows us to build these digital twins, these worlds which resemble very much our real world down to the last physics component, right? And th that is for me that loop number two. So we see now the ability to design, let's say, new airplanes, new devices, uh, you know, new, new GPU fabric. Uh, NVIDIA actually had prepared, shown that the other day. You know, they're using AI to design new stuff and they can simulate that within their metaverse, you know, within their physical, digital representation of the physical world. 
at an accelerated rate. You know, they don't have to do the experiment going to the lab in the morning and doing the experiments. No, they can run it in parallel computing infrastructures, essentially, you know, emulating a million lab hours within a few seconds. So suddenly, you know, we are getting the, the ability to do that, couple in haptic devices to this very physical compute, and suddenly you end up in a programmable world where maybe loop three enables essentially machines to do things we don't want them to do. Okay, uh, we, 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 we really need to, pay to, need to pay attention here with uh, developing these applications in the green boxes, along with the very powerful AI frameworks, along with the accelerated computer infrastructure, you know, are we building a world where we can lose control very quickly? So we need to look at this from a regulatory point of view, from an ethics point of view, uh, and, uh, and a lot of other points of view. So I'll leave that for you just to think about. My second question is, you know, can we finally solve uh, privacy? Okay, so um, everybody geeked out a little bit when uh, Facebook announced that they're going, you know, going to rebrand to Meta and they're going to work on this new uh, metaverse concept, etc. And um, the reason is, it's really because once we're in this worship world, you know, we have a new attention span. New attention span means uh, new advertising opportunities, uh, new ways really to infringe our privacy. You know, machines will understand, algorithms understand us even better than what they know already. So, you know, this great article in the Washington Post here, can this actually be solved? Uh, how do we solve that? Uh, do we still need to do this from a regulatory point of view? Uh, can we trust the terms and conditions of the companies? Or should we do something more as engineers? And uh, you know, I've been working on this notion of uh, privacy by engineering design, uh, which I really believe in. And uh, I think we need to do more. And uh, specifically, you know, in this metaverse world, where suddenly, you know, things aren't regulated. You know, who's going to take care of our children in there? Who's going to take care of uh, haptic engagements you don't want to have? Uh, you know, so this whole privacy issue is very strong, and even the entire ethics issue, right? So. Uh, and then I just started to work with a, with, a, with a scholar here in Stanford University on ethics in the metaverse. I think these are very, very big issues we need to address early on. And we do have the responsibility. So people, you know, our children in 2030 don't turn around and say, hey, hey, dad, hey, mom, what, what were you doing in 2022, right? What, what, why didn't you get that right? So we want to get this right. So my last one is really... It's not a serious question. I, I, I really entice you to go to a blog we wrote with my fantastic colleagues here, Yasha, uh, Miral, and Eric. Um, you know, we wrote a blog really working on this concept of the metaverse and, uh, you know, what has done 5G? Where can we chime in 6G? Uh, a bit of a longer a deep dive on what I presented to you today, but feel free to check it out, read it through, and contact me for any comments and ideas. And of course, I'm always looking for exciting co-authors to write maybe other thought leadership pieces in this space. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to leave you and I'm open for questions and discussions. Um, and uh, I give back the floor to Ian. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Misha. Excellent talk. Uh, it's really very visionary and hope uh, we all will be successful, especially you and Ericsson, of course. That's why they hired you there, right? So uh, are there any questions from the audience? Please uh, uh, type your questions and- uh, Yeah, can... yeah and actually the, you can find them in the Q&A channel. Uh, if you- uh, Oh yeah, I'm in the chat room here, You can yes. pick the ones that you, yes, yes. you wanna ask, thanks. Yeah, I was, I mean, still early morning here in Las Vegas, so. Um, okay, so. There are many questions, by the way, Misha. So the first question comes from Ruben Stephen. Uh, what is the key differentiator of the meta metaverse from the real world? The real world also has a social element and narrative. Or rather, why would someone spend time on the metaverse instead of the real world? Is it because of the ease of connectivity? Bunch of questions, but they're all the same direction, right? Yeah, yeah, no, that's great, uh, uh, Ruben. That's a great question, and uh, I, I, we actually don't have the answer to this, to be honest. You know, um, the clearly being in the metaverse. Let's assume this is a augmented, uh, you know, a digital social construct that allows us to do things we can't do in the real world, right? So literally, you can think of a metaverse where gravity isn't one G as we have it here; it's something else, and uh, maybe you have a non non Euclidean geometry. 
you know, you can just be very creative. And maybe that speaks more to our creative mind um, rather than to our engineering mind, right? So physics, uh, the, you know, the universe has given us the physical world as we know it now. And we are now at the point where we can start simulating new worlds uh, to understand what, what else is possible. Um, and of course, the, the, uh, the, the current metaverses we see are very much a reflection of the real world we have. Um, and therefore, people currently use it more in a traditional way, I have to say, but the opportunities are very large. And uh, I think, you know, people like that social construct, specifically in the, given the pandemic, people couldn't see each other for a long time. Uh, my daughter couldn't, couldn't be with her friends now because we moved uh, to Silicon Valley. So therefore, we will see, I think, people, more and more people jumping on this. Will this be a construct which will be consuming 24-7? I'm, I'm not sure. And, um, you know, maybe we don't want that. Right, so I, the, the, the jury is still open, but at least for something, for entertainment, uh, for being with friends, you can't be really physically, you know, do new things, simulate new things, design new devices, new, new worlds. I think that is definitely a very interesting proposition. Yeah. Uh, Misha, there is uh, an excellent feedback by many people. They loved your talk. They are thanking you for the inspiring speech. So uh, I have to share that, that at least like 10 people wrote uh, very nice uh, uh, feelings about you. <laughs> That's nice. So there, uh, there is this fellow, or fellow, I don't know, uh, Izatu Sar. Uh, let me, he has so many questions, by the way. So I have to, I can just uh, regarding here, holographic yeah. display, can you please comment on the difficult trade-offs between field of view and eye box size. Um, so is that you? I, I see your questions here. They're, they're all great. I'm not able to answer all of them, I have to say, because yeah. I'm not an expert on this. But uh, specifically on this one, um, you know, I can't really tell you the 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 trade off. But what I can tell you, what we have done from a comms point of view, uh, we are able now to um, basically predict your field of view. OK, and, uh, you know, in my opinion, I think the first one who really pioneered this, uh, uh, you know, kind of meaningfully was Yasha, uh, uh, sorry, was uh, Yansha from King's College London. She worked on AI. So the AI is essentially taking your iris, your eye movement, and is able to predict in real time where you're going to look next, most likely. And that immediately allowed us, rather than projecting or streaming a 180 or 360 field of view, we're able to actually narrow it down to something much narrower, so 120, whatever, I don't know the exact value, but it, uh, it was good enough to give the impression you're fully immersive, a bit like, like I do now. If you guys now look straight ahead, you see something very sharp, maybe within you know, 90 degrees and the rest is quite blurred. So this is the type of ability we're able, the, uh, we are able to do. So we are doing this from a comms point of view, and I hope that will help also with the device um, uh, manufacturing side. There is another question by Saber Kamushi. Uh, Thanks for your inspiring presentation. Uh, quantum computing. By the way, I have to say my own words before I ask you the question. I mean, since at least 30, 25 years, we talk about quantum computing and communications. We always say up and coming, up and coming, and it's not coming, right? So it's really, we are still very behind quantum area, but anyway, I hope someday we'll be successful. So the question of Saber is, Quantum computing, which can be a million times faster of traditional computing, so IPFS and other infrastructure that Web 3.0 is running on it will be vulnerable. What do you think about it? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's a great point, Sam. And, uh, you know, let's assume, uh, you know, let's assume that quantum computing will happen one day, okay, let's see. Then uh, you're absolutely right. So you know, quantum computers actually aren't a million times faster. They're actually a million times slower than our computers, but they are probably a trillion on exponential time more efficient, right? So they're uh, effective, sorry. They're, they're not very efficient, but very effective. So they can solve NP-complete problems. So something which is exponentially hard to crack uh, in linear time. And of course, our crypto, uh, you know, our ciphers are such a construct. So you're absolutely right. The current blockchain is protected by ciphers, which can be cracked in linear time by quantum computers somewhere in the future. So therefore, you're right, they're vulnerable. 
So we have started to look at this post quantum uh, future, and especially when I was still at King's, you know, I looked at uh, there are two or three families of codes which can live in this world. So either you know blockchains in the future need to migrate to a, a quantum key distribution uh, a system, which I'm not sure how we're going to do it in a distributed setting. So it's actually a very interesting question to ask here. The second one is uh, lattice codes, and then there was another family. And actually, NIST, uh, the National Institute of Standards Technology in the United States, is about to publish their recommendation. What type of ciphers should be used to be quantum resistant in the future? Once that recommendation is out, I would hope that the likes of uh, uh, Ethereum will do another migration to these quantum resistance codes. But we need to keep an eye on that. So, <clears throat> thank you. There is another question, but I'm not sure that the time will be uh, allowing you to answer this because it's an open question. Uh, Dimitrios Tiro Wallace, Wallace is asking, you mentioned security through engineering towards the end of your talk. Could you elaborate on that a little further? If it's too long, uh, uh, Misha, you can take it to offline if you prefer, but if you want to answer it, please go ahead. Yeah, I could just say it wasn't actually a security by engineering design, it was privacy by engineering design, right? So very quickly, mm -hmm. you know, if you look at a security by engineering design, we're using ciphers to protect our infrastructure. Think of an equivalent of privacy by engineering design. How can we do that? Okay, and if you want to know what I think, how we do it, just get in touch with me, Dimitris. Good question. Yeah, and Albert Lisko, uh, he's a friend of mine from South Africa, by the way. Uh, Albert is asking, Spectrum requirements for 6G are concerning as they give impression that 6G will need all that spectrum. And consider that the seller has a lot of spectrum and is unable to use most of the spectrum. It has efficiently, except for a few hot spots, does 6G as a seller technology really need more spectrum? And, uh, you know, anyhow, you should answer it because, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Should, should not be rather consider Wi Fi, whatever, you know. Uh, BE or whatever such in or such instead for spectrum, especially the metaverse is likely to be indoors for the first several years. That's a great point. Otherwise, perhaps should not spectrum be shared as a default method of assignment rather than assigning it to 6G specifically. Yeah, so the, uh, Albert, by the way, I hope you're well. So, I, you know, it's a great question. And, uh, you know, sitting on the uh, Spectrum Board of Ofcom, we're, of course, uh, debating occasionally these type of questions. How, how do you do the split and how do you handle that, uh, the Spectrum auctions in the future? There's a great study by the GSMA, which looks really where the, the biggest value is created. And currently, you know, the, the verdict is that, um, you know, licensed Spectrum creates the biggest value. And this is because the... Um, you can assign service level agreements, right? So with Wi-Fi and licensing and spectrum, you can't do it simply by the virtue of uh, the, 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 the legal construct. Having said this, you know, I mean, the, the Wi-Fi will not disappear. It will always be there. There's always the coexistence. And we are actually a very symbiotic ecosystem right now. A lot of offloading happening. Um, Wi-Fi currently doesn't have a limit in terms of, you know, the spectrum Wi-Fi 6, 7 has uh, six and seven Wi-Fi seven uh, is enough to power probably most of that, but in a very kind of uh, local environment. The beauty of the cellular technologies is, is it's it's a it's a global it's it's a national it's a it's a wide area construct, but also global construct, right? So in Wi-Fi you can't actually you know go somewhere else and easily get access. You need the code, you need to type it in, etc. Whereas you know you can buy today your mobile phone in the United States with a SIM card in in Buenos Aires. Uh, you know, and call your friends in Australia who got their phone somewhere else. So, therefore, you know, th this type of thing only works with that standardized ecosystem. So, therefore, I think let's look symbiotic of what's the future. Let's see who has the bottlenecks and let's make sure we get the maximum value out of this. And these are open questions, are they? Okay. And I, I think there's one more question by Romeo Giuliano. Uh, I think he's in Roma. Uh, thank you, Misha. I believe that the future world virtual physical meta should be trusted, but the blockchain will have a focal point or other tools can be used, even if not distributed. It's only one single question, meaning like all these long sentences. Okay. Uh, be trusted. Block, blockchain will have a focal point or other tools can be used, even if it's not um, distributed. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, indeed, uh, Romeo, uh, hi, by the way. So the, the um, it's, a, it's a great question because 
people really think that blockchain will solve it all, but actually it is a technology which enables that trust and the provenance. So we need to get it right still, and probably we need to have auditing mechanisms built in, and that needs somehow to be regulated. So I, I, I think there needs to be a strong regulatory uh, angle there. And currently blockchain is something where regulators are, you know, maybe the financial conduct authorities or the finance guys start to look into this and started to regulate this a little bit. But I think from a wider ecosystem, we need to start looking at that as well. You know, how can we use blockchain as a, as a technical construct to help us with the trust issue? Because one, one and the other are not necessarily the same. So you, you're raising a really great point. And I think this could be a future work item. Thank you. You know, uh... Before I close the Q&A session, I want to point out that that's the biggest challenge in my opinion. And one of the biggest challenges is the latency and the data rate problem, right? I mean, you mentioned that. And, you know, today's internet will even, I'm talking about wired, uh, are far from satisfying those uh, requirements. And then we will also go towards, you know, like your company, like to wireless and mobile, that will be much more challenging. Do you think that the next 10 years, we may somehow succeed to meet those uh, uh, requirements in terms of delay, like latency, as well as throughput? Uh, yeah, so you asked him to look into crystal ball. Actually, it's quite ironic yeah. that you always looks in the crystal ball. Asking <laughs> the question. Let me let me try to answer that, Ian. So, you know, I, I, I think it's all, all possible. So, I mean, the data rate problem, in my opinion, is really just a scale problem, right? So either you put more, more, more base stations or you make the base stations bigger so you get more MIMO arrays and more spa spatial channels uh, and or you get more spectrum, right? So I think we can solve that in one way or another. It's just an investment question. Um, the latency is a physics problem. And I've always been arguing uh, ever since, you know, I started working on this internet of skills of mine, you know, where I have this vision that you're able to transmit skills for the internet. For, the, for such an internet to succeed, we need global low latency. If you currently look at uh, the, uh, the, the low latency uh, um, pitch decks, this is local, right? So it's a manufacturing hall. It's maybe over 100 kilometers to the next edge cloud. But what if I want to have a 10 millisecond link from, um, from San Francisco uh, to, 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 to Buenos Aires or to London or, you know, wherever you guys are? Uh, and then physics comes in. Speed of light, we can't cheat it, okay? And this is where we need to start coming up with constructs which allow us to give the perception of low latencies. So there, therefore, my plea to the community is to move away from the very physical kind of working on low latency to also start looking on the perception of low latency and how this can be solved. And uh, I leave that maybe as an, as an opening, uh, kind of as a, as a closing remark uh, to, to my webinar keynote today. Uh, I just realized it's really interesting because Tariq Taleb from, I think he's in Oulu in Finland, he thought about the same thing. I just saw it and I'm, I have to read this so that he will not think that I stole this question. Absolutely not, please. So Tariq was saying about when Metaverse becomes deployed at a large scale, having most of the functions offloaded, the transport network will become a bottleneck in terms of both bandwidth and latency. I mean, that's what I mentioned. Current IP protocols will fail in handling such large... I mean, it looks like we had a telepathy from here there. Large-scale deployment of bandwidth, hunger, and latency-sensitive metaverse apps. What future do you see for IP? Do we need a new IP? In fact, you mentioned, you answered it, but uh, maybe I should elaborate on that. There is this new IP issue going on. You know, the Huawei folks are really pushing for it. Uh, what do you think about it? Do you have some uh, opinion or shall we cut it off now? <laughs> you know, I, w I was, you know, 10 years ago, yeah, as you know, we've been trying to come up with a new IP construct for, for decades now. So 10 years ago, I was very excited about this. You know, then I uh, kind of founded and co-founded a few companies and I became very realistic on what really works and doesn't. And IP clearly is a very simple construct. It has a big ecosystem attached to this. And as long as your machine speaks IP, we somehow can solve, uh, you know, that communication challenge. And um, the, you know, all the extras we we bound in uh, were always patchwork and IGF clearly. So it's not ideal, but at least it works, right? My only, you know, I, I think as humans, will we come up with a solution which will be uh, uh, post IP? You know, I don't have 
a lot of faith in this, to be honest. But I have faith in something else, uh, Ian and uh, um, Tariq. You know, I have faith in uh, AI possibly designing a new transport protocol, which we haven't even thought about, right? So industry is using this already. So I was at the keynote of uh, NVIDIA CEO the other day, uh, or CTO, and he talked about how AI designed a new G GPU fab fabric. And he said, we, as human engineers, we never came up with this idea. And then we looked at it and we thought, this is, this is rubbish, this is impossible. It turned out to be a Pareto optimum design. And this type of construct, so the moment AI can design new transport protocols and we can uh, get this implemented across you know, machines automatically, this is the future. And I call this actually self-synthesizing network. So uh, Etsy, and I've seen uh, David is on the call as well. You know, Etsy has run a feature article in October last year about these self-synthesizing networks. And this is where I really see the future. And maybe this will help that challenge. Thanks a lot, uh, Michelle. Excellent, really. A lot of people were happy uh, with the webinar. Really, I'm, I'm uh, extremely appreciative to you and also especially for your time. And I close the Q&A session and I ask uh, Alessia to take over and ask you a bunch of personal questions. <laughs> so good luck. Thanks a lot again. We'll see you. Bye. Thanks, thank Ian. you so much, Ian. You. Thank you for moderating this session. And thank you, Professor Dollar, for this very interesting talk. So now we can move to the Wisdom Corner, Live Life Lessons, so which is uh, based upon the idea to give a unique and special angle uh, to this uh, new webinar series, um, adding a personal touch. So successful researchers like you today uh, will guide uh, students and young scholars, researchers, uh, in the field of current ICT research. And they will also share some pills of wisdom, pretty sure, and impactful life lessons. Uh, so life, we all know, it, it's an incredible journey of discovery and learning. And success is not because we never fail. Uh, success is because we never give up. Uh, you would probably say nothing can stop you, citing one of your beautiful albums uh, that I'm enjoying <laughs> these days, actually, that I discovered. <laughs> Congratulations. Uh, many of you might know that Professor Dollar is also a very talented composer and pianist. So I would like to move to, our, to my first question, uh, which is your um, hard-earned life lessons or, or failure that you would like to share with us uh, that uh, people attending the webinar today might uh, uh, find useful? Uh, it's, a, it's a good question. Uh, you know, I, I, I was thinking about this for quite a while, and I think you know what I realized it, um, very early on in my life. And I'm really looking at the the young young scientists on the call who might be watching this video, right? So that transition from being a very kind of green young scientist engineer um, <clears throat> into you know a a kind of a scalable or very mature and uh, you know hopefully successful scientist. And you know, I had a one pivotal point. And that pivot point is when I realized that really collaboration is uh, really all what matters in our community. Okay, and a lot goes with that term: collaborate and be open. Uh, you know, it is uh, you know be kind. Uh, you know, try to support your colleagues, etc. But really, that you know, it, in the early days of my uh, PhD, for instance, I. I invented or probably co-invented this notion of a distributed MIMO array, the idea of having, you know, several, uh, you know, antennas and distributed mobile phones, and then we can mimic this MIMO link giving us a lot of capacity. Um, and I couldn't publish about it because we patented that with Kings and, uh, you know, it set me back a bit. So I became quite um, kind of protective of that area. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I felt it wasn't going anywhere. So, you know, there's this very young, unknown guy sitting in, in London somewhere in a dark office has come up with an idea, which I still think is brilliant and really has actually uh, caught up. And I realized, you know, the only way of really moving the needle here is, and that's really what you want to do, you want to move the needle, is to really collaborate, to really come together with people. And that means share stuff, uh, even though you think, you know, others could maybe take it or steal it or do something else or whatever. You know, my experience is so fun. Everybody who's on the call who has been contacting me for things knows I'm sharing without any problems, right? Of course, now being part of the corporate, you'd be more careful with that. But generally, I remember the days when Prince Roberto Verdona, one of our uh, friends from Italy, you know, contacted me like, uh, Misha, can I have your MATLAB code, uh, you know, for your um, uh, distributed MIMO simulations? I say, yeah, here they go. And, and 
I still have that email. He was in complete shock, right? So because it never happened to him that somebody shared the code. And uh, so I put it online and we started sharing, you know, this open source type of spirit uh, is a very, very powerful from the science point of view. And, uh, and, and, you know, just to cite a historic event here, you may think that Newton, uh, you know, Leibniz Newton had invented calculus, right? And, um, and actually calculus has really bootstrapped humanity. Everything we do today, the fact that we can speak with each other, I say today, and people can listen in is because, you know, calculus has been invented, other things as well in the way, but this was really the kind of the starting point. Turns out uh, the, the Greeks had uh, invented calculus uh, 2000 years earlier. Now they have two priests have done this and rather than publishing this, they have actually hidden this in, in some temple. So therefore that knowledge was lost. Imagine if they had shared that knowledge widely, we would be now in an equivalent year of what would it be like uh, 2000 years ago, we would be in the year 4022. Okay, so therefore share knowledge, you know, share knowledge and, and the whole envelope, be kind to your colleagues, uh, help them, help your younger colleagues, uh, you know, they're all going up this, uh, this, uh, this ladder, etc. I want to build a career making one in, a, a contribution. So maybe this was my biggest pivotal point where I've clearly done mistakes before, uh, learned from that, and that has really changed my scientific career and my life. Wow, thank you. Uh, second question. Which strengths and capabilities uh, do you think students, uh, young researchers, should be mo most focused on developing and how should they plan to do that to, on accomplishing this? Um, I think the most important thing we can learn today is, uh, is how to learn. Okay, so it seems a bit counterintuitive, but uh, if you look how we have evolved you know, the amount of new stuff coming our way is increasing now at exponential pace, okay? By the time we stop talking, something new has, has been invented already, okay, Alessia? So therefore, the pace of innovation, because we have this fully networked construct called the internet, is now uh, uh, exponential, if not uh, super exponential, right? Um, and therefore, you know, nailing down on a very specific skill or domain in the traditional sense, like, uh, you know, I learned to play the piano, um, you maybe learned something in engineering, you know, these type of things, they, they, they are great for a base. So get your basis right. But actually the biggest skill we need to learn is how do we learn? How do we reskill? Because we will be needing to reskill many, many times, right? And that is a skill which I think comes to short. It comes to short at schools. It comes to short in universities. It even comes to short in dinner conversations of families, right? So I try to tell my daughters, you know, really learn, work out a very good working methodology on how you learn things, because this will really enable you to become you know, something along the way where you always need to pivot slightly. So I'm not say, saying you need to go from taxi driver to quantum, quantum computer developer, but, you know, we are clearly pivoting. And those who have succeeded really uh, over the last decades are the ones who have been able to reskill at a very, very high level. So that would, be, that would be my answer, if that makes sense to you. Definitely, very clear. And in which field specifically and which topics would you recommend students to study nowadays? Uh, also taking into consideration your own cross-disciplinary research and innovation in technology, sciences, arts. Yeah, so the, I think from uh, topics which will stay for a while is, uh, you know, the engineering computing is quantum. It's, it's, it's been something which actually, you know, is kind of a holy grail mainly from a physics community and now starting to become a bit more mainstream and uh, becoming mainstream it means we can now build things and we can use it and uh, suddenly also physicists are developing new quantum computer languages right so we will have whatever python for quantum or c for quantum so suddenly we have abstracted something extraordinary complex into something uh, which we know already how to deal with so therefore if a computer science scientist is on the call try to understand quantum and uh, you know, learn these emerging quantum uh, program languages, and uh, the engineers equally should do that. Um, but from a more wide construct, you know, I think what would be quite interesting to look at is you know the the ability to bind in a very three hundred and sixty picture, right? So, and I, I think the big challenges of this twenty first century will not be solved in a very siloed way. They will, as you have said, I totally correctly, be a horizontal challenge, right? Uh, there will be 
you know, there will be electrical engineers working with mechanical engineers, uh, <clears throat> with chemical engineers, maybe material scientists, computer scientists, you know, physicists, mathematicians, artists, right? So policymakers, um, we need, we all need to learn th their language. So it's a, it's a linguistic problem, really. Uh, their language, their way of uh, thinking, and uh, it may not be something you want to spend a huge amount of time on, but uh, you may want to really pay attention to workshops or to events where you go to uh, in fields which are not your fields. Try to learn them. You know, and I, for instance, organized uh, in London, you know, a workshop, a series of workshops in the National Theatre, right, together with the Young Vic. And I brought artists together and I brought engineers together. And the first day was a disaster. Yeah, it's a real disaster. I guess they just couldn't, uh, you know, couldn't make uh, ends meet. And uh, but we kind of aligned languages, we aligned expectations, and uh, we suddenly saw we saw this power really of bringing together these two communities. Where I personally have always seen the, you know, the tech community to be very innovative but not very creative, and the the, uh, the arts community very creative but not very innovative. Right. So bring them together. Suddenly we had this big bang moment, and uh, you know, on day day two and three of the workshop. We did magic and we need more of that. We need more of that uh, Renaissance type of magic. Yeah, wonderful, fully agree. Okay, tell us one of the most tangible contributions uh, that you have made in your career that had uh, a direct impact on, on your life, or professional, personal life, and on others' life that you're most proud of. Now, which one do I pick now? Um, so maybe the one which is really the epiphany of it all, kind of the convergence of, you know, my work for decades was that world's first 5G uh, piano concert <clears throat> I did with my, with my daughter, okay, and uh, it, it had everything you can imagine, okay, everything, it had, uh, it had cutting edge technology. It had history, it had emotions, and it was, it was a night where when I was playing the piano, I actually, you know, I struggled not to cry, okay? It was so emotional. So what happened is, is over the years, we had developed this 5G technology design with Ericsson, presumably that's why I'm, I'm here actually, uh, very low latency, very high bandwidth, and with my fantastic team at King's, you know, <clears throat> we were thinking, and how do we bring this to life? And uh, I worked a lot with an artist. In fact, I hired an artist, Ali Hosseini, a fantastic person, wonderful person. And uh, he said, look, Misha, we need to bring this really to life through a very personal experience. You know, um, you need to fly to Berlin and uh, play the piano there. We're going to connect you live, uh, real time, low latency, high bandwidth uh, to your daughter here. Uh, I didn't want to fly, actually, because, you know, I wanted to be with all the politicians in London and the <laughs> big opening and all this. He said, no, no, you have to go. He was absolutely right. So that's why I'm saying, you know, he advised me as an artist saying where this emotional thing comes in. So we, I flew to London and I was uh, uh, playing the piano under the Brandenburger Tour. My daughter, Noah, was in the Guild Hall. And the Guild Hall is uh, 2,000 years old. And uh, it is actually London's and UK's very first entertainment venue. The Romans brought it 2,000 years ago. As you know, the Romans, Italians know how to party. And they brought this to, uh, to, to the UK. And we thought, let's take this very historic place, put in very modern technology, connect it in real time. And, you know, I have to say, really kudos to my team. We made it happen. Um, and uh, low latency, very first time on this commodity technology that happened. And Noah was nervous, I was nervous, and uh, but we got this very immersive, the first time in my life I experienced immersive comms. We had very low latency codecs, very low latency networks. She was with me. She was holographically projected, but she was with me. This emotional bond was built. And that, that has really shaped, I think, a lot of thinking in the community uh, has, has been, really been kind of the, the leading way, you know, for, for my piano career, my composition career, uh, the music career. Noah, by the way, sang with, uh, with Madonna on two songs on their last album, Madame X, so she's on there. So she's an accomplished singer as well. So we brought it all together, the family story. And that is a moment I'm very, very proud of. Wonderful. Actually, I watched it. I recommend uh, anyone uh, attending this webinar to watch it. It's, uh, it's on YouTube. And it was extremely emotional, I must say. But I think the, the synchronicity was just amazing. It was really amazing. And you really showed the world. I heard that already, the power of 5G. Uh, and I was wondering, is this what uh, an example of what you call uh, giving technology a soul? I'm very, very much intrigued by, by this concept uh, that I heard you, you said it in, in some interviews. Uh. 
Yeah, I, I, lo I, lo I love it. You know, I, I love it because uh, I think we need to do more of that as engineers and computer scientists. You know, more often than not, we like to just think about whoever listens in. You know, your typical day is probably either now at home <clears throat> or before the pandemic or now again. You would come to the office, you would go into your office, you would close the door and just do a bit of coding and designing things, building things, etc. So, you know, and uh, I thought, you know, being in London back then, you know, we're not only good in tech, but we are good in a lot of different societal things in the UK, in London, you know, is a, the health or arts and transport and all these things. And, uh, you know, I thought, you know, my, my, my folks uh, in my center as a director back then, you know, they should see more than just boxes and cables and millions of lines of codes. They, they should understand what is that technology for. They need to be able to speak these stories around these technologies, you know, and that storytelling is the most powerful way for us to really convey messages and convince people. We have been using that for millions of years and it's a narrative which really has stuck you know a lot of things have died or have been superseded but storytelling has actually survived so therefore you know bring that storytelling into technology was really for me to give that technology some soul right some life some you know some aura and that's really what i wanted to do and i think we succeeded in doing that you know i created also as a, as a side result people now with a lot of uh, passion not only for technology but for the wider societal pictures and i think we need more of that Wonderful. Okay, last question, I promise. Uh, it's very enjoyable, um, this conversation. Is, is there a motto, an aphorism, I usually ask a book, a movie, a piece of art or music in your case, that describes you best or you, your professional path that uh, you would like to share with us? <laughs> so maybe I should cite then my, I think, first or second album, which is titled Nothing Can Stop Me. So, uh, or Nothing Can Stop You, actually. You know, that probably uh, describes me best. But, uh, you know, I, I'd like to, um, you know, I'd like, to, you know, I'd like to see myself a bit as, a, you know, this Renaissance picture. And I, as I said many times before, you've heard me now really talk about this at great length. Um, we, we need more of this. You know, that concept uh, in the, uh, you know, 200 years back, that Renaissance movement was very powerful, has really been a quantum leap for humanity at large. And uh, the magic of this was that, you know, physicists weren't only doing physics. And, uh, you know, philosophers weren't only doing philosophy. We had people who could do a lot of things, right? So uh, as an example, you know, we had, uh, it was a slightly different epoch, but uh, Goethe, for instance, one of our German's leading authors, you know, he was a biologist. He was a scientist at the same time. Uh, you know, we had, we had really people at the, at the Renaissance period, um, you know, with a Renaissance spirit. And of course, this has carried on, but over the years, we've, we've started to structure things in a very siloed way. You know, school is very siloed. You do subjects very siloed. University is very siloed. You have to do, pick your degree. Then you get a job, which is very siloed. And then we, then we are surprised if things don't really work out in the end for, for us as a, as a human race, right? So therefore, I think that um, one thing I really would like to get across more in dinner conversation, it starts really there. Okay, it really starts there. Dinner conversations uh, in schools, you know, in in universities, in companies, with a regulator all around the world. Let's really start to think Renaissance. Build these sandpit environments where people of very different uh, backgrounds can actually be together in a very safe place and invent new things, create new things, um, and and really make society a, a better place. Oh, thanks. Sorry. I actually I came to my mind that uh, um, I know that you met uh, many very successful people coming from very different uh, domains, fields, like from, from politics, academics, uh, uh, industry, sciences, even fashion. Uh, and I was wondering, uh, talking to them, having conversation to them, what, what, what do you think they have in common? I wouldn't ask you which one inspired you most, but what do they have in common? What do you think they have in common? They actually have that. Now that is a great question you ask, guys, a really great question. I never thought about this, what they have in common, but I think they have exactly that Renaissance uh, spirit in common, right? And <clears throat> I personally see the world, you know, when you're born, uh, you know, you're, you're born in front of three canvases, okay? So the first canvas, is, a, is the canvas of science. It is trying to understand what the universe has given to us, how it works. The canvas, we have to try to understand why is the canvas white? 
why does it stand and not collapse? Why, if I paint on this, the color sticks, right? So this is understanding the past. That's canvas number two, one. Canvas number two is to understand the present or deal with the present. This is uh, literally the canvas an artist would use to paint, right? Picasso, Dali, they would just use that to paint, create art, to deal with the present. And uh, any artist knows, you know, we're using it rather as a diary. I come home, I sit on the piano and I just improvise, you know, I, I don't think about the specific note having a specific meaning. And I don't believe in all the stuff we did at school where we're supposed to interpret books and music and all that, you know, it is really dealing with the present. So that's canvas number two. And canvas number three, is really creating the future. And actually, we as engineers and scientists are often in front of this canvas. It's blank. It's like, you know, the wall behind me. It's just white. And, the, you know, we start things from scratch. We create the future. We create magic. So when you're born, you're born with these three pencils to basically paint on these three canvases. And then society tells us to throw away two, two pencils, okay? And what I would love to have is this real world where we at least can keep two pencils. We can be artists and engineers, or artists and physicists, all ideally all three together. So, I, and this is what all these three people had. And the, I can tell you the person actually who inspired me more is uh, Rob Del Naja, who's the lead singer of Massive Attack. Uh, apart that he's a wonderful personality, a great artist. You know, I worked with him quite a bit over the years in, in, in London. And, you know, he's not only a great uh, musician, He's an artist, he's a painter, he's a, he thinks about politics, he thinks about policy, uh, a, a really 360 renaissance man of this, of this century. Wow, wonderful. Thank you so much for being so generous in sharing with us uh, your experience, your lessons learned. I was really, really enjoyable. Now I would like uh, Ian uh, to come back with us and to, uh, to give uh, some closing remarks. Um, Ian, the floor is yours. Again, thanks, thanks Alessia, and thanks, Misha, for everything. I, I really enjoyed it, and I, I also heard the back from the audience. They also loved it. Uh, really, thank you. And I personally wish you all the best with Ericsson, and uh, hopefully in five years we'll see you in South Africa or something. <laughs> 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 it's amazing. Bravo, really. Fantastic. It's not easy. You know, people do the same thing and same place. So I'm really, uh, my hat's off to you, really. My hat is off to you. So fantastic. Okay. Thank you again. I, I officially invite uh, um, uh, Professor Dollar uh, Ian to come with you to uh, Accra uh, for the IQ Kaleidoscope Academic Conference on Extended Reality. And Ian will be our keynote. And I'm, I'm officially inviting you to join us at the Ghana India Kofi Annan Institute uh, Center of Excellence in ICT that will be held in December this year. <laughs> Where will I would like to conclude with that. Uh, yeah, I hope uh, we will meet again, Michelle. So the COVID is almost gone. So I see here Vegas, everybody is on top of each other. So I think <laughs> the pandemic is gone, I hope. So Hopefully, thanks a lot yeah. again, Michelle. And I yeah, yeah. Uh, would like to ask uh, the audience, uh, please submit your papers. Our journal is open access and free for authors, no page limits. And uh, it's really uh, for professional service. So uh, we look forward to receiving your papers and also if you have any ideas for uh, special issues like this extended reality or hologram, uh, please let us know. We'll be glad to entertain your uh, requests. And uh, next uh, time we'll meet on June the 1st. It's another very hot topic. It's called semantic communications, transmitting beyond bits. Uh, this is really the hottest topic. Everybody's writing papers on that. You know, this is like uh, always these phases. Now it's semantic communication. In fact, you can use semantic also what Misha was telling, uh, you know, underneath uh, of all these uh, hologram and the extent reality, etc. And the speaker will be Xi Chin Chin. She, uh, she's really fantastic in this field. She wrote so many pioneering uh, uh, papers. She's with uh, Queen Mary University in England, uh, UK. So we look forward to listening to her. And uh, so I think we'll uh, close this uh, webinar today, right? Yep. Again, right. enjoy Thank you so your... Much. Yes. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Cheers. Thank Goodbye. you. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.